We continue now with the race for the House of Delegates' 98th seat, and uh, this is a seat that will be contested by the Democrat Troy Miller, and now Delegate Joe Funkhauser recently appointed to that seat following the resignation of Delegate Paul Espinosa, who took another position. Uh, gentlemen, good morning, and thank you both for coming here. We appreciate your participation in this event today. Each of you will be given a minute or so for an opening statement, uh, another minute or so for a closing statement. We'll reverse the order based on who goes first uh, with the opening statement. You'll get questions from Bill Stubblefield, retired admiral, former Berkeley County Commission president, and from New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. And I'd ask you to limit your responses there to one to two minutes if possible. If your name or one of your policies is invoked by your opponent, uh, during the discussion, you have the right to a direct response at the conclusion of their sentence. Just give me a heads up. I'd be glad to call on you to do that. As we start with opening statements, I will begin first with uh, Delegate Joe Funkhauser. You have a minute, Joe. Good morning, Rob, uh, Bill, John, uh, and, and John. Thank you for hosting this important debate to better inform the voters. I'm offering my candidacy for the 98th d District's delegate to be their effective voice in Charleston. I support transparency, accountability, and integrity at every level of government. I believe those are pillars uh, which make sure that government works for the people. I believe you know, this election is, is a choice of who's going to best represent your values and interests. And I'm running for the people of Jefferson County, and I believe my opponent is as well. But it is still a choice, and I believe I'm the best choice to represent the good people of Jefferson County's 98 districts for, for many reasons. I believe uh, I want to champion common sense, Jeffersonian and West Virginia values um, rooted in faith and family. As I'm a business attorney and a civil litigation attorney. I think that adds to my value proposition. I grew up in Jefferson County on a farm. I have demonstrated uh, public service conserving Jefferson County as a member of the Jefferson County Farmlands Protection Board. I've served also on the Charlestown HPPA that represents the horsemen at the racetrack in addition to the Charlestown Racetrack Chaplaincy. I graduated Jefferson when we were one high school county as well as at Shepherd University studying political science and WVU uh, Law School. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. And now Troy Miller. Thank you all for hosting this. My name is Troy Miller. I am the Democratic candidate for District 98. And um, you can find out a lot more about me at my website, troyforwv.com, T-R-O-Y-F-O-R-W-V.com. Very short time with the opening statement. I'm originally from Wheeling, West Virginia. I uh, graduated Lindley School there and went to Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. I was in Washington, D.C. for about 10 years studying environmental and economic, environmental and energy policy, with especially in economics. And over that last 10 years, I've also worked professionally at the dual, at the intersection of broadcast, advocacy, journalism, and um, organizing around the issues that really uh, taking on the monopolies that kill West Virginians. And I'm talking specifically about big pharma and the insurance companies. Um, I've been proud to fight for the provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act that are saving West Virginians money and lives, their lives right now, whether it's out of cap costs for seniors, whether it's uh, insulin caps costs for uh, people on Medicare, or whether it's Medicare negotiating drug prices for the first time in America's history. Um, I'm proud to fight for all of these things at the national level. I will take this fight to Charleston at the local level, and I'm proud to fight for the people of District 98. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. And now for the first question, Bill Stubblefield. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, the recent drought in uh, Jefferson County, Eastern Panhandle, coupled with the fact that there's some talk about data centers coming into this area, which use a lot amount of water, uh, has heightened our awareness of the vulnerability of our groundwater. Is there anything that the legislators should do and or can do to protect the availability of our groundwater, both quality and quantity? I'm thinking more quantity than I am quality right now. Start with you first, Mr. Funkhauser. I, I do believe that the legislature has a role to play there. I've committed to working with our local governments, particularly the county commission, the city of Ranson, uh, in terms of uh, being more proactive with our infrastructure and so we can maintain and enhance our quality of life and the drought has uh, brought more attention to the to the area you know I uh, live off of Earl Road and we used to have two ponds there that were full 80 percent of the year now it's more like 20 percent of the year um, so it's we're, we're with more people we're using more water I think um, 
I, I would like to work with the Jefferson County Commission to get our ducks in a row, so to speak, before we and see, hey, if th th there's been talk of in the county commission of funding a water study, um, the, county, the county commission in Berkeley County actually has some policies here that in terms of a water economic or a water impact study when they have new developments, and I would want to work with them and you know, what's our maximum carrying capacity? What what do we need to do, it, you know, on, on a regular year versus a 100-year a, a drought year sort of thing, and how do we plan for that accordingly? Because if you dig it deep enough, we're all drinking from the same well. We do have a beautiful alluvial river valley with the Potomac and the Shenandoah. We should be kind of the Saudi Arabia of water. But, um, you know, it is definitely a concern because without water, your, your farms are not going to uh, be able to, to grow things, and you have to have good water, and that should be a priority for the legislature. Mr. Miller, I was actually kind of thinking about a more statewide legislative involvement as opposed to regional. Okay. Oh, absolutely. And one of the things, as uh, Delegate Funkhauser alluded to there, is we need to know what we have and what the, the state needs to be doing more to not only study what we have. I mean, I think we're looking at something like 70 percent of the headwaters east of the Mississippi originate or flow through West Virginia at some point. This is a, of national concern, and so there should actually be some national involvement to protect our natural resources here. Um, that being said, I'm going to say two words that don't often come up in West Virginia debate, but we have to deal with the issue of climate change. And that doesn't, I'm not talking about the issue of whether carbon is contributing to that issue or not, but simply acknowledging the fact that the climate is changing, that the scientists haven't been that far off with their estimations of what's going to happen, how fast the atmosphere is warming, how much more moisture the atmosphere can hold then, and the associated droughts that because of the Arctic collapse, for instance, I'll have the jet stream that create these high pressure systems such that last week there wasn't a cloud in the country basically what east of the Mississippi. Um, these are concerns that we need to be taking seriously at the legislature that I do not think, uh, I'm sorry, I don't think my opponent will be using those words down on the floor at any point, and we need somebody who is going to champion these things because this is not just a Jefferson County issue, this is not just a West Virginia issue, this is a national security issue when push comes to shove. Thank you. Would that not be more suited toward a congressman, though, Troy? You know, it has to work at every level, as, as uh, many of the people have talked about here. And uh, that's while it may be more suited to a congressman to be advocating for that, I think the, it is important that our delegates be able to discuss this in these terms and not have to hide from the terms climate change because immediately you're going to get beat up by the coal and natural gas interests. I will say I am proud to be endorsed by the UMWA and the coal workers in this state, and I want to make sure that they have a representative down there who will fight to make sure that not only are their jobs protected from automation as we go forward, but that they are able to get put back to work with good jobs with dignity like manufacturing in other parts of the state. Thank you. John Gilstrap. Uh, I guess I guess this is primarily for for Joe, but also for Troy. Given what you just said, um, the Eastern Panhandle has long been the economic driver of of West Virginia, and given the state of affairs, economic affairs in other parts of the state, it's a very important role. And as we see more and more people come into West Virginia from parts north and, and east. Uh, the bucolic nature that you celebrate your fourth generation of agricultural roots here, uh, by definition, that sort of has to change over time. So I'm curious how you see the Eastern Panhandle area changing over the next 10 years or so. What kind of industries you see coming and, and what will you find acceptable? And where is the balance between the, the bucolic and the, the industrial? And then I'll ask you to talk about the same thing. Well, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, Jefferson County, the population has doubled in my lifetime, and we're going to continue to grow. Um, it, the question is how we grow and what, what you know, uh, we need to broaden our tax base. And I fully support industry. My great-grandfather um, was one of the industrialists that industrialized Jefferson County with the Dixie Narco and Ranson and, and other business interests. Um, the city of Ranson actually just changed their zoning from, you know, um, I think, getting the sort of the blowback uh, with the heavy industrial that came with Rockwell, and they changed it all to light industrial. I don't think anyone has any problems with Bardain, those good, solid, uh, light industrial manufacturing facilities there. Those are good middle-class jobs. They support our people. Uh, we have some appoint training facility. That's a very unique uh, government contractor. You know, I would, I would 
definitely encourage those. Um, you know, I'm endorsed by the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the Eastern Panhandle Business Association. We need to be more business friendly. Uh, half the people in Jefferson County commute to Maryland and D.C. It is a challenge when it comes to being competitive with our public sector uh, salaries, but it's also an opportunity. I really think we need to lean into that agro-tourism even more so. We, it, we're, we're right next door to some of the wealthiest counties in the, in, in the country, and, and we are the gateway to West Virginia. Our CVB is the, the most uh, fund, funded CVB because we have 7 to 10 million visitors every year. We need to be more of a destination attraction to encourage that wealth to come here, people to come here for a day or spend a weekend. They just might spend a lifetime. Troy. This is one of those questions that, first of all, is critically important and is impossible to answer in one minute. But what I will say is we to balance the, the needs between – Look, it's very frustrating for me because I came in here, I moved to Jefferson County at the end of 2018 when it was just being thrown out a very good idea, Northport Junction, and what we got instead was Rockwell. And now we have to work with this new reality, and it does go back to the issue of the water resources of the county because I don't think we have fully accounted for what Rockwell is drawing out. I don't think when there are these droughts, when the retention ponds and their whole recycling plan all of a sudden goes out the window because there was no uh, rain, there was no surface runoff. Beyond that, I think what I saw was a notice that at the old 3M uh, plant down there, they're looking to put in a, a water bottling plant, which, incur which brings up a ton of questions, because that counts as light industry, I believe. But are we just bottling our groundwater to ship it away? Because that's no better than putting in a utility-grade uh, solar field, that, which I've been on the record to oppose, utility-grade solar field to send energy to data centers in Virginia to do AI generation and, I don't know, mass surveillance on the American people, which is what happens at those data centers in Virginia. Um, what we need to be doing is recognizing that development is not a goal unto itself. Development is a process to achieve what we want to do. And I, as much as I pr appreciate the due diligence at the county level of the planning commission and everything, I worry that whatever they come out with can be torn out, torn up and thrown aside just the same way that the last comprehensive plan was when, as uh, former Delegate Do John Doyle was talking about before, we go after the next shiny thing in the form of tax cuts for out-of-state corporations, which I have been long on the record opposing. So. It's a community effort to decide what we want to do. And if we want more light industrial, then that needs to be done in a way that's transparent through the Planning Commission and through the County Commission. And I don't think the community of Jefferson County feels like that's what's happening right now. Thank you. Follow-up, John? Yeah, I do. I, we know what you don't want to have. What do you want to have? Well, what we do want to have is light industrial, but light industrial that can be done without drawing on the water resources. It goes back to that essential question of what do we have here resource-wise. And it's difficult to start with what do we want to have when there's a whole lot of plans that are already unfolding that we, you know, could have done slightly differently. Let's be honest. The housing developments that are being built now are not some new thing. These were deals that were done 10, 15 years ago. And that is a difficult thing when then you're asking, well, how do we balance what was sealed away 10, 15 years ago and some things that we thought were moving toward forward 10, 15 years ago that are no longer not the case, that are no longer the case, for instance, around Rockwell where some of that's zoned industrial, um, right on the brink of the county or on the delegate lines there. They're also trying to build in a huge amount of houses. And the, we keep on, it's kind of like the gun is being held to our head in the county of, do you want all these houses or do you want a data center? <laughs> you know, what water intensive industry do you want? And I feel like the, what we need to be talking about, and I'm sure my opponent will agree with this, is how do we bolster the thoroughbred industry? How do we get more people coming to the things that are here? How do we get more people going to the casino from out of state, spending their money, and then going away? Right? We have a fantastic thing going on here, and all we need to do is invest in our small businesses more, invest in the resources that will attract other businesses, fire, EMS, good water resources, uh, good medical care, things that will attract new families, making sure we have child care in the area, making sure that people, that newborns can uh, be delivered in Jefferson County and not have to go to Berkeley County. I'm sorry, I've taken up a lot of time, so, uh, but I appreciate the time. Bill? Yes. Do you support certificate of need? Start with your first drawing. It's one of these things that I think we need to, uh, um, it needs reform. I mean, the problem is when we have, uh, it's basically a government-granted monopoly, right? 
And I don't approve of that any more than I approve of what the drug companies do, where they get a government patent and then hold a government uh, hold that monopoly, which is what a patent is and what a certificate of need is. Um, we need to make sure that we have ways of opening up the market, opening up real competition, because sometimes what the hospitals and other places are demanding, the drug companies specifically, is not free market uh, competition, but in reality they want government granted monopolies that looks like free market competition. And so it's, it's something that we certainly need to revisit um, because I don't think we can honestly say that there can be too much care in a given area in West Virginia. I'd like to see that place and then we can deal with that problem when we get there. Joe? If I were king, I would probably follow Milton Friedman's ideal health care solution, which is universal catastrophic coverage and free market for the rest. But we have an incredibly, enormously complicated health care system where our, the federal government really is in charge of a lot of this stuff. You cannot shop across state lines, which makes our risk pools lower, which makes our insurance more expensive. And so in terms of providing the care, it depends on the specific question, the certificate of need. You know, I am not fully decided on that. There have been been some where they've allowed the free market to go and, and, and getting rid of those certificate needs. I'm not aware of any certificate of need that has not been granted here in the Eastern Panhandle in decades. So if they say it's broken, well, why is not you know why are they not getting rejected? But it does protect some of these more rural hospitals in other parts of the state where. Uh, you know, hospitals are a different business. They have to stay open 24-7. They have to treat all comers. No other business in the, in the, in the country has those requirements with EMTALA. So, um, you know, the, it protects them in some ways where some private uh, health care facilities would poach the most profitable uh, treatment and in, in, in imaging and things like that, and then those hospitals would go under. And so we have very unique needs in Jefferson County. I've, I've heard it's actually more profitable than the, the Berkeley Medical Center because of its rural Rural health designation and the federal dollars that flow there, and so we just got rid of our birthing system. And there's a whole different business model with the WVU hospital um, uh, there, and we have a lot, you know we have a lot of competition in our neighboring jurisdictions. I've got one constituent; she lives here because her she has one doctor she really likes in Frederick, Maryland, another one in Winchester, Virginia. So that's why she lives here. It's right in between them. So we, we can't control everything um, uh, beyond our borders, but I'm I, I'm all for trying to improve our health care system. Um, but this, in terms of the specific certificate need, I would have to sit down with all the stakeholders and uh, before I make that decision. I would like to add that there is a value to it to keeping private equity in check from coming into our rural systems and undermining essential care that is there. But I would say that that's actually <clears throat> the problem with too much market is there exactly as he laid out, there is poaching for the uh, – whether it's the – most profitable procedures and the most profitable sort of equipment that you can charge the highest for reimbursement rates and all of this, or whether it's very simply what happened, uh, what happens now under the ACA and was happening before, where people are just thrown, tossed off of an insurance plan because they are not profitable. And this is my problem with uh, the the idea that we should have Medicare for some because what that ends up being are all who want it, which other Democrats have proposed. Um, the problem being that the sickest and oldest people would all up, end up on Medicare, driving up costs for everyone, and uh, that's be before we even talk about the issues of the Medicare Advantage plans that are just shoveling our money towards private corporations to enrich themselves. So keeps Joe Namath and J.J. Walker employed too. I guess. <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, we have John Bowser Bauman from Sean and all that. That's right. He's been the one <laughs> lately. That's right. Uh, John, back to you. Okay, carrying on on that from your website though, you call for legislation that will guarantee a living wage, a voice in the workplace through collective bargaining, comprehensive health care, decent, safe, and affordable housing, I'm quoting now, free access to the broadband, to broadband internet, and other free services that are obviously never really free because somebody's got to pay for them. So if, if elected, these have to be paid for somehow and by someone. So, you know, if, where is that going to happen? If, if we're going to preserve, if we're going to preserve the bucolic nature of, of, of an area and re how are we going to pay for all of that? Well, let's be very clear. This is not a list of, I would love if any of these things could be done with a uh, single piece of legislation. I appreciate your reading off the list. What this is saying as a 21st century economic bill of rights is that these are the things that basically every piece of legislation in the West Virginia legislature should be working towards for everyone. And that there are a hundred ways to do any number of these things. And there are some more market-based solutions. There are some with 
more government intervention. I, it's tough to know because with the current legislature, we're told that there's a billion dollar surplus, but we know that's untrue. Much of that surplus cannot be used for new projects. It can only be used for existing legislation and all of this. Beyond that, how much of that surplus actually exists is another bigger question because some of that has been, for instance, a quarter billion dollars that can only be used for schools that we cleared our school maintenance list with when it was time to spend that. So. The question of how do we pay for these things is secondary to do we want to work to do these things, which is what I'm saying and what we need to be, why this is front and center in my campaign. Um, very simply, our U.S. Constitution lays out uh, security, general welfare, and liberty in that order in the preamble. And I would argue that these things are the things that work to secure, that work for security for the individual and for the general welfare through which liberty can thrive without these things, as FDR said, necessitous men are not free men. But with all respect, broadband Internet is, is very specific. That's, yes. that's not... Yes. Hey, have you tried to apply for a job at Walmart or Target without Internet access? It's, oh, it's I live impossible. in a very nice house and I don't have broadband <laughs> Internet. So that's not... Well, that, that, but I guess... For the amount of money that we've spent on studies trying to figure out why rural areas don't have broadband internet, I can tell everyone right now, it's because it's not profitable for the private corporations to deliver it. There aren't enough customers down those lays to lay the fiber to make it profitable. So th there has to be a government intervention there at some point. And there's community broadband solutions, there's co-op co solutions, there are ways that we could set up, but um, in many states, for instance, in uh, I believe it was Tennessee, uh, there was a whole municipality that set up their own broadband internet and Comcast went to the state legislature and buried it and made it un, 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 impossible for it to be, they made it illegal, which is as anti-market as one can be. Um, and so there's, and frankly, the only companies that are delivering this are what, Comcast, uh, Frontier, now Verizon, formerly Frontier, formerly Verizon. And let's be very clear about how Frontier exists in West Virginia, or has existed for about a decade now. They were the spinoff of the unprofitable rural lines on Verizon. That's why they could off say they offered Fios for a decade now, even though that is a trademarked Verizon brand, because they owned the fiber optics, because it was an unprofitable uh, endeavor. And once they were driven underground, once they lost enough money, Verizon bought them back up again at a, a, a discount, and now we're back to Frontier and Verizon. Why are we bothering with this? And how many billions of dollars did we spend on the broadband studies to tell us that it's not profitable for the private market to do this? That's, I think we can have these conversations as adults at the legislature without saying he's trying to buy everyone broadband. So the, uh, take that Thank question you. however you want. <laughs> so <laughs> my, my opponent supports a cradle to the grave welfare state. He admitted as such at our, at our, at our Shepherd uh, University debate. And when you ask him how he's going to pay for it, he starts blaming corporations. Um, and, and, and The source of inflation right now, yes. Excuse and, me. And, and so, um, you know, I'm more uh, one to acknowledge reality and work to improve it. Sit down with the stakeholders um, in terms of, you know, the De West Virginia Democratic Party says health care should be a human right. Well, it's a human right in a number of other countries, and, and the, that human right uh, in, in reality resorts to rationing for years if you can survive, you know, in Canada, in the United Kingdom, and so on and so forth. So in terms of the devil is in the details of how you um, work to improve whatever it is, whether it's health care, whether it's broadband, whether uh, any number of issues, and uh, we are a relatively poor state. Uh, we have a $5 billion or so state budget. We have about $15 billion in federal matching funds, primarily in health health care and uh, um, education funding, and I'm very sensitive to that, and I think uh, we need to optimize our um, federal reimbursement rates. I, I would say I don't want to have a, a, a blanket, you know, anything that the federal government's offering some reimbursement funds, we ought to do it, but look on a case-by-case -case basis because to, to better serve the people of West Virginia um, and, and with a uh, governor uh, that can, um, you know, we have a very strong governors in the state that can effective affect that uh, change to make sure that w this we don't have to go to special session like happened in this last year because of some confusion and ambiguity with the federal government. Yeah, you know, we need to be very much more proactive with our federal government partners. We pay a lot of we pay we all pay federal taxes, and so we need to you know that needs to be at the forefront of our budgeting process as being good partners with our federal government. Follow up, John. Yeah. No. Uh, quick question, Bill, because then we have to move to closing statements in two minutes. It would not be a, a delicate form if I did not ask the question, 
do you support home rule for counties? And I'll start first with you, Delegate. Try to limit your answer to one minute if you can. Well, I would re refer you to Bob Astris's law review article on home rule and the history of West Virginia up through a couple of years ago. And it depends. So I do support <laughs> the Local Powers Act. It I depends. do support the <laughs> land use planning and, yeah. uh, with the counties. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that Jefferson County has countywide zoning, one of five counties in the state to do so. But in terms of when it for a tax increase um, and things like that, uh, I that it has to be more balanced with in working with the state. I, we have most of our municipalities actually gotten the pilot program for home rule, and um, they're doing well with that. But if it came to the county, I would probably put that to a referendum. Or uh, in terms of raising money from an additional sales tax, you know, make that the, what the existing sales tax. Uh, go to the state and send that to the county rather than raising taxes. I don't think we need to be raising taxes. But home rule is more than just a 1% sales tax. Well, how do you define home rule, I guess? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of different things yeah. with yeah. Uh, in, in that. You know, it just depends on how you're defining home rule is which portions I would support. But also the other uh, significant disagreement that me and my opponent has is I don't believe that the counties or the municipalities should circumvent your constitutional rights. I don't think that they, they should have uh, you know, str stricter gun control uh, uh, ordinances or sanctuary cities or things of that nature. I think those laws need to be uniform throughout the state. Troy Miller. Um, I absolutely support home rule, and I believe that the best governance is local governance. I believe that municipalities and counties should have as much leeway to go above the whatever the floor that the uh, state sets to go above and beyond that in any number of ways, whether that's uh, uh, doing a 1% sales tax increase. Because, again, what people need to understand is that's not 1% that's going to Charleston. That's 1% that then your city or government or county government, with your input, ideally, I mean, it doesn't always work that way in West Virginia, but with your input is deciding how that's going to improve services in the county and in the municipality. To uh, any claim that I support uh, curbing cities curbing the constitutional rights, I find it absurd on its face. Look, all I'm saying is that if a city in West Virginia wants to be as law and order as any old west town where you had to check your guns at the door, if the city municipalities say they're going to have stricter gun control than the state level, the constitutional carry, I think that's absolutely permissible. I think also they should be allowed to experiment with ranked choice voting. If they want to, if they can figure out how to do a universal basic income pilot, God bless them, let them do it. I believe that uh, our states are laboratories of democracy, and I do believe that we are a democracy. I don't think Thomas Jefferson would have called states laboratories of democracy if he didn't intend us to actualize that. But I think then when you get down to the county and municipal level, that's even more of a place where uh, this, these types of experiments should be done. And people, the local flavors should be able to express themselves. And if people don't like it in that way, uh, same way as if a municipality said, you know, everybody must carry a gun when you're outdoors. You know, if there's a constitutional way for that to be enforced and that's what a municipality says, God, God bless them, go for it. But that should be within the powers of the municipality. We move to closing statements now, and we stay with Troy Miller to go first as you went last on the opening statements. My name is Troy Miller. I'm proud to be the Democratic uh, nominee for this position for, to represent West Virginia House of Delegates in District 98. My website is TroyForWV.com, T-R-O-Y-F-O-R-W-V.com. If you search my name, Troy N, as in Nicholas Miller, W-V, Troy for West Virginia, any number of things, you will find my positions longstanding on issues of I oppose the closing of North Jefferson. I oppose these, school, these utility scale solars as they are coming in. I generally oppose most tax breaks for corporations in the forms of pilots and TIFs. I feel like they have been, they've backfired across the country. And this and so much more, I appreciate the time to be here. I appreciate the, the civil discourse that uh, Delegate Funkhauser and I have had for 10 months now. And uh, I, early voting starts tomorrow Thank, and in Jefferson County. Every early voting position is at Charles Washington Hall every day but Sunday, basically until the election day. Please get out and vote no matter who you vote for. Thank you. Delegate Funkhauser. 
Thank you for, for hosting this debate. My name is Joe Funkhauser. Uh, my website is joeforjefferson.com. Please email me at joe at joeforjefferson.com. I do pledge to communicate and or meet with all constituents so I can best represent them. It's hard to make sure that 18,000 people or 1.8 million West Virginians can agree on everything, but I believe that I can balance the, uh, the consensus there of what our priorities ought to be. I support lowering our taxes and keeping more of what we pay here in Jefferson County, uh, protecting our constitutional Bill of Rights to safeguard individual liberties, promoting family values and defending life, um, in increasing education funding to improve education outcomes, as well as increasing the, prop the homestead property tax exemption for to help our seniors and disabled vets in addition to being fiscally responsible uh, and going with the Tennessee model, model and phasing out our uh, income tax. Uh, we need to have uh, sustainable growth and proactive infrastructure, and I would like to be your voice in Charleston for that. I'm endorsed by the National Rifles Association, West Virginians for Life, West Virginia Farm Bureau, the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce PAC, the West Virginia Coal Association, the Eastern Panhandle Business Association, and the Home Builders Association of West Virginia. And I ask for the most, endorse, the most important endorsement of all, your vote at the ballot box beginning tomorrow early voting and through November 5th on Election Day. Thank you. Thank you both, gentlemen. You we both. wish you both the best of luck come Election Day. Thank you all.